Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you can all hear me clearly. Um, thank you very much for this invitation to um, be able to share uh, the experiences of Japan with you all. I'm very sorry that I uh, could not attend this uh, conference in person. I've been um, attending online and it looks very interesting. There was a fascinating presentation just now about Korea and um, also the earlier report about the, um, the situation uh, in Taiwan was uh, fascinating. So um, yes, once again, thank you very much for this invitation. And we're going to be quickly presenting um, some perspectives that um, relate to the just transition uh, in Japan. So I'll just going to um, uh, begin now, uh, excuse me. Sure. So the background. So um, basically, um, uh, the concept of a just transition is not explicitly discussed in key um, policy documents in Japan. And um, when we talk about the, you know, the key um, policy documents that relate to um, energy policy, there are basically um, the, the main one is this um, basic energy strategy, and this is renewed every three or four years. And if you like, you know, do a search through there for a just transition, you will find zero mentions. There's another very um, uh, important strategy that was um, formulated by the um, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, which is the Green Growth Strategy. This is similar maybe to the you know, Green New Deals that we have seen in Europe. Um, this also doesn't mention the word just transition. So many researchers and stakeholders around the world think that the Japanese government is not thinking about the just transition. But this actually is not an accurate um, assessment because there are many relevant issues um, with the just transition that are discussed in these documents. For example, we find many um, mentions about solar energy. There's a big um, you know, effort to grow the solar industry. And there's many discussions about this problem about you know, where to site these solar installations. There's acknowledgement that um, the growth of solar is causing um, a um, um, damage of the um, Japanese rural um, scenery. And there's also emphasis on consulting properly with uh, citizens. There's also this emphasis now on um, addressing this issue about the um, end of life waste. Then regarding electric, mo electric mobility, just like the case in Korea, Japan has um, a very, um, uh, the automotive industry is very important for Japan's GDP. We have a very large uh, portion of the population that is um, employed with this. And um, so this is going to have big impacts. And this is um, starting to be acknowledged in these policy documents. So there's this vision of um, converting Japan's gasoline stations to comprehensive energy hubs. And I'll explain this in a moment. That's basically shifting away from gasoline. And there's also an emphasis on um, really looking after the part supplies because you know the big automotive companies, Toyota, Honda, for example, they're making the transition and they're going to be okay. But what we worry about is the part supplies that you know um, have these very large numbers of workers that serve these broader um, um, uh, supply chains to the automotive industry. So there's an emphasis there on shift on supporting the shift here. So um, if the Japanese government doesn't explicitly talk about just transitions, who does talk about it? Well, um, there's um, probably, I think, about three sort of key reports that I think summarize you know, um, the, the discussions from um, non-governmental stakeholders so far. The one on the left here was um, just released a few weeks ago, and that was by some, um, a, colleague, a colleague here at Kyoto University, by another um, researcher from Kyushu University, and by some researchers in uh, England. And um, they gave a nice um, sort of, you know, overall overview of the um, situation in Japan. And I'm going to present some of the statistics that they have. We have an NGO in Japan, um, a Kiko Network, that's very influential in climate change. They talk about this, but mainly from the experiences of overseas. Then we have a, like a research group that has a lot of very close contact with certain, you know, members of parliament in the Japanese government. And they talk very explicitly about the um, just transition. Um, so uh, coming back from uh, so this report here, they have a, a quite an interesting um, table that sort of um, has been, um, I think, um, taken inspiration from some of the other reports. And they try and sort of map out some of the sectors that they think are at risk from the energy transition. So they look at you know, fossil fuel power, steel, petrochemicals, nuclear. Of course, nuclear doesn't emit CO2, but possibly in an energy transition, then this could be at risk. But um, I think that it's quite clear that the Japanese government and the incumbent utilities still support nuclear. And then vehicles and paper. So um, vehicles are in grey here. I'm not sure if you can see here, but there's um, almost, I think, about 200,000 people, um, employees, that are, um, are classified as high-risk jobs. And we can see that this um, varies significantly um, according to the region. So um, this is the Tokai region, which is um, around Tokyo. And um, so many of the part supplies, I guess, like in many countries, are um, located in regional uh, cities. 
And so this is um, sort of uh, considered around the Tokyo area. This um, is uh, considered as a very high risk area. Um, and there are lots of discussions about this in Japan, and the Japanese government included is aware of this, and I'm going to showcase to some of the discussions about this later on in the presentation. But before we go there, I'm sorry, um, I would like to talk quickly about the power sector because it was, this was the other job, I uh, sorry, the other sector that I promised to talk about. Um, I'm very sorry, maybe I can jump back to the slides here. Um, I don't talk about this in, in detail at all, but um, the numbers um, for the fossil fuel power sector, like you know, for coal-fired power plants, gas-fired power plants, these are physically workers at these plants. The numbers you'll notice are much, much smaller compared to the automotive industry. Um, so anyway, let's talk about the power sector. So Japan is, um, as you know, has um, an energy mix, uh, electricity generation mix that looks very similar, I think, to um, I think many other countries, maybe Korea. We um, generated 32% of our electricity from coal um, two years ago. That was basically the same last year. And then LNG, we have a big reliance here, and we see a, we have a very small um, share of nuclear, and that's because of the Fukushima um, disaster. Um, renewables, uh, please don't be fooled by this number because half of this includes hydroelectricity. So. The modern day renewables, which is basically in Japan, is basically just solar and a little bit of wind, maybe I think 1.5% of wind, so that's here. 9% of this is um, uh, hydro. Anyway, the idea is basically to double this in the next uh, you know, 10 years. Well, we've only got eight years left. Uh, the idea is to expand uh, nuclear back to sort of, I guess, the pre sort of Fukushima value. That's going to be very difficult. The idea is to rapidly reduce gas because gas, as we know, is extremely expensive. There's a big problem about getting, you know, steady supplies into Japan and reducing coal. So what this means is Japan's energy transition is going to, um, uh, we're going to have a share of uh, non-fossil fuel sources that's going to grow to now 60%. And we're going to uh, introduce here hydrogen and ammonia, which I think is a topic for another presentation. And you'll also, also notice that the um, overall um, volume of the electricity is going to reduce because of a population decline and because of increased energy efficiency. So um, solar in Japan has really grown. And um, here, if we look at this graph here, we can see in gray, these are the countries. Um, this is showing us installed PV capacity. And China, by far, is the champion of the world. They have um, over 300 gigawatts. Um, the unit here is gigawatts of capacity. Next is um, the USA. They have about you know one quarter of um, China, and very close to the USA is Japan. Ja Japan is um, a very, um, I think, um, not very widely recognised, but it's a quiet achiever in the rollout of um, uh, PV panels, and it's quite amazing. We're actually ahead of Germany and India, and um, but there's actually um, if you um, convert this to our land surface area, Japan is as a country that has a very small land surface. We're actually by far the world champions in terms of um, you know, how many solar PV panels we have um, per um, uh, square kilometer. And this is by far um, ahead of, like, for example, the USA and China and um, other countries like Australia. So um, what this means is, I mean, this is quite remarkable how we've actually built so many um, such a solar capacity in such a short amount of time. But um, what this means is that we have um, – there's a high concentration of solar in a very limited la land mass. And what this means is that um, we're going to have a lot of justice impacts that are really concentrated in, the, in these small areas. And one of the justice um, relevant impacts is actually waste disposal. So um, this is starting to become a very, um, I think, um, very widely discussed issue now in Japan. And we, we, we're realizing with the growth of solar and, um, and with the um, coming to the end of the, the FIT, the feed-in tariffs scheme, um, if we take an average lifetime of 20 years, we can see that we can expect a large amount of waste to start occurring um, in about 10 years time and rapidly increasing um, a, a within a few years. And then if we just assume different lifetimes of um, solar um, PV panels, then we can expect to see large volumes of waste. This is absolutely huge, by the way. The unit here is, um, as we see here, 800,000 tons of um, solar PV panels. This is a phenomenal amount of um, waste. This is very relevant to the just transition. What are we going to do with this waste? And so, um, well, there's actually been um, surveys from the government asking the PV um, operators, are you setting aside money? Because right now they're getting you know, very nice income from the feed-in tariff. Are you setting aside some of this money so you can dismantle your, proje your project at the end of its life and then um, you know, reuse this waste or do something with this waste? The far majority of PV operators are not saving money. And I think we can probably assume that this is reflected in the rest of the world. And that is because um, around the world, um, PV operators are probably not mandated by law to recycle their panels. And um, a very, very small number 
um, are saving. And we can see here that the majority of people that are saving are the, um, the operators in the uh, high voltage, the, so the larger um, operations. So this means that if um, these um, operators are not saving um, to you know, um, dismantle and to treat this waste, then there's a risk of illegal dumping or just an abandonment of this, just doing nothing, just leaving it there, letting nature take over these um, installations. There's also a risk um, uh, setting aside this issue, there's a risk that natural disasters like you know, floods, hail, snow, wind, they can damage PV panels and they can also cause um, um, a premature emergence of um, waste. So Japan is um, starting to address this. So here's a photograph actually of um, an abandoned PV field. You can, hear, so you can see here that the kind of trees are starting to grow in these panels. So this is really the situation that people such as myself and other stakeholders are becoming very worried about because um, Japan actually has a history of just abandoning things and just leaving them there. If you go for a drive in the countryside in Japan, you'll see gasoline stations, you'll see restaurants, you'll see ski stations that are basically just being left there, just like a, um, you know, a, a, a bottle on the side of the road. And um, so if you look at this and you think, well, it's not really um, hard to imagine that in the future we're going to have lots of these emerging across Japan. So there's a very um, urgent situation to do something about this. So the government has made um, a policy change. And the idea is now that is there any solar um, PV operator that has an installation above um, 10,000 kilowatts, which is quite a small installation, they must set aside a share of their savings to an external fund. And this must begin 10 years before the end of the feed-in tariff. And um, the operator must report their savings, their balance, to the government. And the idea is, is that this would um, allow money at the end of this scheme for um, these panels to be removed from the mountain and to be recycled um, or reused because um, this is showing us all damaged ones that obviously have to be recycled. Um, so we can, we can landfill these, which is um, the, the cheapest option, but landfilling um, would create toxic um, waste because they're full of dangerous um, uh, substances, including lead and some um, um, other dangerous chemicals. And um, recycling them costs a lot of money. So um, the idea is we need to save for this. Another issue is siting. So um, in Japan right now, um, because we have a limited uh, land area, um, the PV developer, and we have a limited um, availability of flat land, the PV operators are targeting these mountains, these mountain slopes. And this is causing problems because we have a lot of rain in and the rainfall hits these panels and um, we get, um, you know, sometimes uh, landslides. And so this is increasing the risk of this. So we're having um, negative impacts on the, on, um, on the safety of these ecosystems. And it's also deteriorating the scenic beauty. And many residents are worried about this. They, they think, you know, will a landslide occur in my neighborhood? Um, and there's an, also an issue about the economic benefits because um, unfortunately a lot of these um, are built by external stakeholders and there's very few employment benefits. Um, um, yeah, the, the employment benefits for the local community are basically non-existent. Ironically, it's far less, for example, than having a fossil fuel or a nuclear power plant. And the, um, the largest uh, national newspaper has done a survey to prefectural governments, and they realized that 80% of these governments are reporting troubles, um, basically, you know, problems um, with citing. So basically, this is um, a, a problem that's occurring across Japan. And so now the Japanese government is um, um, making large projects, like this one here would be a large project. They're making them um, carry out impact assessment, um, in mandatory environmental impact assessments. Um, that's good for larger projects. For smaller projects, we only have guidelines. These are voluntary guidelines, and they just give you know, advice about you know, preserving scenery and nature and you know, avoiding accidents and encouraging um, engagement with local residents. So this is a little bit soft. Many um, stakeholders think this is not hard enough. We need... All, all types of projects to have environmental impact assessments. And also some, pre, um, some prefectural governments are also making um, you know, prefecture level requirements such as environmental impact assessments. Um, so let's quickly move over to the transport sector because this is also a, quite an interesting case study. So um, as I said just before, the just transition is um, not actively you know, explicitly used by the government, but um, actually um, the negative impacts on, the, on employment and the economy because of this transition to electric mobility is very widely discussed in Japan right now. We have it discussed by the media, by the media, by the automotive industry, by think tanks, researchers, books, and the government policy. Let me take you through a few of the um, uh, announcements. So basically um, in Japan, the Japanese government suddenly a few years ago um, decided to um, announce um, an imminent ban on um, internal gasoline engines for the year 2035. After large protests, probably from Toyota, it's decided that this will include um, hybrid vehicles. 
Um, this was a big shock because this, um, a lot of people were unexpected for this um, announcement. And the opposition was very, very strong, especially from Toyota and the Automobile Manufacturers Association, of which Toyota is the chair. In, in newspapers, this is um, an overseas Wall Street Journal, you see um, that the um, Toyota is very explicit in very publicly opposing this ban. They're sort of saying um, the current business model of the car industry is going to collapse. We're going to see the loss of millions of jobs. It's quite interesting to see the figure here, millions of jobs, when the figure I showed you from the previous analysis was um, est estimating around 200,000 at-risk jobs. But what I should say is that that figure does not take into account gasoline stations. It does not take into apply, you know, the parts and, the, um, you know, these um, invisible um, uh, actors in the supply chain. It also doesn't take into account, for example, mechanics as well. And so um, after this, um, Toyota and the JAMA um, began um, a, ne a negative information campaign. And for example, they started to use this idea that there will be f there's 5.5 um, million people working in the automotive industry in Japan. And um, the idea is um, they're saying if we regard the internal uh, engine as an enemy, so this is the uh, as an enemy here, um, we won't be able to export these cars. And um, if we stop exporting our cars, then 5.5 uh, million people would risk losing their jobs. I mean, frankly, I think this is um, a very gross exaggeration, but um, it shows you that um, they take in this um, concern about the impact on jobs very seriously. And so they're arguing that we should um, make our enemy um, not the internal combustion engine, but making it carbon, which basically means that hybrid vehicles are okay and also opens the door for other options, for example, um, synthetic fuels. Around Japan, we have, an, um, we have a problem actually, regardless of the um, transition to electric mobility, we have gasoline stations that are actually um, are declining 2% per year. They're declining because of the population decline because of higher efficiency in vehicles and because uh, younger people are driving less. And again, we see these um, very sad sort of uh, scenery around the countryside. This is going to increase as we see the transition to electric vehicles. So um, the sixth basic energy strategy um, discusses this. And it says, let's move away from gasoline. Let's move to comprehensive energy stations that provide EV charging, that provide hydrogen, because like Korea, where um, Japan's putting a lot of emphasis on fuel cell vehicles, car sharing and other services, for example, like uh, coin laundries, uh, la laundries <laughs> for doing your washing. So um, that's quite an interesting statement. And then um, also um, the Japanese government recognizes that the, um, the parts suppliers are going to be highly impacted by the transition to EVs. So um, uh, the green growth strategy sort of sets up a vision of part suppliers um, that, you know, today make parts for the gasoline vehicles, like, you know, engines, like transmissions, um, you know, oil pumps, things that we don't need in an electric vehicle, shifting to EV parts. And the, the government's pledging financial and institutional support. And this support, the idea is to provide training and human resource fostering to give information seminars um, uh, about you know, the growth of the EV market because a lot of the parts suppliers still don't understand the emerging storm on the horizon and providing subsidies for buying equipment. So to um, operationalize this, the Ministry of the Economy, Trade and Industry have set up what's called a Mikata project. Mikata means um, ally, friend, ally. And um, basically they um, are targeting regions, especially the regions where the automo automotive industry is concentrated. And they, they basically set up an information window. They send their experts to the company to say, hey, this is what's going to happen to your the industry in the, in the future. This idea of the EV shift, this is not a joke. This is real. Get ready for this. They also provide experts to help these smaller companies come up with strategies to um, transition. We have, a, um, as I said before, like the, the Green Deal. We have the green growth strategy and the government is going to provide subsidies and loans for these smaller companies to um, set up in new equipment. So the idea is to help them move from you know, making engine parts to making EV parts. So this is quite um, an interesting um, initiative that many people in Japan are not aware of. So I have a lot of colleagues that think that the Japanese government is not talking about the just transition, but they are, they're just using different words. They're sort of focusing on you know, negative economic impacts. They don't w use the word just transition, which is a very European Western concept. So um, I would just like to um, you know, um, uh, conclude with a few thoughts here. And I would just like to point out that I think that the prevailing um, you know, conceptualizations of just transition are very much focused on people. They're very much anthropocentric and they're very much focused on the economy and workers. And we can see this very clearly from these, you know, tra from these statements, for example, from the International um, Labor Union and this idea about you know, leaving no one behind and we, this focus on the economy. 
But I think um, from the case of Japan, we see that we sort of also have to take into account, you know, the non-worker communities like residents that are affected by, you know, the installation of these um, solar PV arrays. I'm sure this is an issue um, in Korea and Taiwan where there's not much land available. The environmental impacts, these are not, that the nature is not a human, but we have to account for nature and ecosystems um, in our um, consideration of justice uh, impacts. And also the waste management burden, which in many cases is going to be borne by our children. In the um, International Panel on Climate Change, the sixth assessment report actually provides a statement. Um, they, they talk about uh, the, you know, energy, uh, the inter uh, about the just transition, and they mention this idea about intergenerational justice. And, um, and the impacts of policy. So I think that's quite important. And then I just would like to direct your um, attention to an interesting paper that was um, written by um, a colleague of mine a couple of years ago. And they looked at energy um, justice transition, uh, sorry, they looked at um, impacts of, in related to energy justice in a supply chain of fossil fuel. And the fossil fuel extraction started in faraway countries. They were based in America. They were looking at Colombia and also uh, uh, gas fracking sites around America. And they realized that there's justice um, impacts all across the supply chain from the extraction of fossil fuels to the processing to the transport to the use and then finally to disposal and i think it's quite clear in the case of japan that we really have to pay attention to um you know that the, the siting for example of sea, um, uh, solar pv panels that that have a very green um sort of image and also the disposal of um these very um you know f environmentally friendly technologies if they're not disposed correctly they can create environmental justice problems so um, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. I hope that I didn't go over time and thank you very much.